Okay, now that we know something about the order of filling, uh, which of course is this right here, of course we got that from the chart with the arrows, talked about that in the last video, now we're all set to actually write electron configurations for atoms. So let's start out somewhere simple. Uh, you want to start with the hardest one first, right? So let's, let's say oxygen, for example. So I look in the periodic table, and I see oxygen. I look for the atomic number. Atomic number for oxygen, of course, is 8. So if I have 8 protons, how many electrons do I have in a neutral atom of oxygen? Well, I've got 8 electrons as well. All right? So write me the electron configuration for a neutral oxygen atom. Okay, well, I've got eight electrons, and so it's kind of like having eight cars, and I need to find parking spots for my little eight cars. So where am I going to put them? Well, I'm going to fill up the lowest energy sublevel first, and I'm going to go to the next lowest, and so on and so forth, until, well, I run out of electrons. All right, so the first two electrons are going to go where? Well, they're going to go in the 1s. So we're going to write it like this, 1s2. All right, and when you see this configuration like this, this is not 1s squared. This is read as 1s2. And what that means is there are two electrons in the 1s sublevel. Okay? And remember, I can only put two in there because any s sublevel only holds two electrons. So what are the, what's the third one going to do? Well, it's going to find the next lowest that's not full, which would be, in this case, what the 2s. See? How many electrons can I put in a 2s sublevel? 2. Any s, I don't care, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, any s always holds 2 electrons. Alright, so 1s2, 2s2, okay, well now that's full, so where am I going to go? I'm going to go to the p. How many electrons can I put in a p sublevel? Well, 6, remember you got your 3 p orbitals, your p sub x, your p sub y, and your p sub z. Okay. I can put 6, so it's 2p6. Well, no, it's only 2p4. But I thought you had to have 6. No, you don't have to have 6. You can have a maximum of 6. You know, a Fox Science parking lot can hold um, 400 cars. Can I put 399 in there? Sure. Can I put 200 in there? Yeah. Can I put 1 in there? Sure. Can I actually have none in there? Yeah, it's possible I have none in there. But can I add 401? No, because the limit is 400. It's the same way here. A P can hold 6, but I'm only going to put 4 in there. Why am I only going to put 4 in there? Well, because I've only got 8 electrons. See? So your electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. And that's the electron configuration for option. Check your work. Add these numbers across the top here. It should add up to 8. 2 and 2 is 4. And 4, there's your 8. Okay? We'll try another one. All right, well, let's look at sulfur. So I look in my periodic table, and I find out that sulfur is uh, atomic number 16. So I've got 16 protons, so 16 electrons. So write me an uh, electron configuration for a neutral atom of sulfur. Okay, well, we're going to start out with the 1s2. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. ZdP holds 6. What's after 2p6? Well, 3s2. What comes after 3p, uh, 3s? 3p can hold 6, but I'm only going to put what? 4 in. Why? Because it has to have to 16. They, you just, just start here and just start filling them up until you run out of electrons. Notice if you don't have this correct, you're going to miss every single one of these, plus what we're going to do here coming up below. You've got to have the correct order of filling. It's absolutely vital. you miss every electron configuration that you do if you don't. All right? Count them up. See if you got it right. 2 and 2 is 4, and 6 is 10, 12, 16. There you go. Okay. All right. Let's try another one. Uh, here's argon. Okay. Argon has how many electrons? Neutral atom? 18. Atomic number 18. So 18 electrons as well. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Okay. 
2 and 2 is 4, and 6 is 10, 12, and 6, there's your 18. So that's how you check your work. Make sense? Okay, let's try one a little bit bigger. Let's go with uh, silver. Okay, silver has 47 electrons. So where do those 47 electrons go? Well, according to our order of filling, up here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d9. Okay? Count it up. 2 and 2 is 4, and 6 is 10, 12, 18, 20, 30, 36. 36 and 2 is uh, 38, 38 and 9. There's your 47. Yep. See, it's that simple if you've got the order of filling. If you don't have the order of filling, I guess it's not quite so simple. Okay. Side note. Uh, if you look up the electron configuration for silver somewhere in a book or whatever, you won't see 5s2, 4d9. What you'll see is 5s1, 4d10. Why is that? Well, there's a little something called half-shell stability. Uh, it turns out that if you half-fill a sublevel, there's just something inherently stable about that. And so remember that our little, uh, remember our little uh, 4s, 3d situation where they were very close in energy? Well, these are pretty close in energy as well. The D is a little bit higher than the, the 5S here, the 4D is, but they're close. And so what will happen is sometimes an electron will hop from this 5S into this 4D. Now, why would it do something like that? Well, because if you do that, you have filled up this 4D and you're half filled on this 5S. See? And it turns out that that half shell stability thing is better than having that electron in that 5s, which is slightly lower than the 4d. All right. And so that's why it does that. And so occasionally you will see some things that are different than what I'm what we're getting from the order of filling. Uh, for example, uh, oh, they love uh, chromium. They really love chromium. Uh, you see this on standardized tests all the time. It goes something like, um, yeah, I'm looking at my periodic table over here. Uh, it goes something like uh, 4s2, 3d, uh, four. Uh, but in reality, it's at 4s1, 3d5, and it's that half shell stability you half filled that D. Uh, molybdenum does the same thing. It's, you know, 5s1, um, 5d, uh, 4d5 instead of d2, um, or rather s2, d4. But then you get down to tungsten, and it's like, uh, what is it, 6s2, um, 4f14, uh, 5d4. Okay, so for chromium, it's uh, it does the half shell stability thing. For molybdenum, it does it, and then for tungsten, it's back to S2D4. So you have an exception to the rule, and then you have an exception to the exception of the rule. You know, and and we can sit here and we can play that game all day if you want to. We can play exception to the exception to the exception to the exception of the rule, but let's just not. Okay, so if you give me the electron configuration here from the order of filling and you don't do the half shell stability thing, I'm going to count it right. It's going to be okay. But you need to be aware that, yeah, there is such a thing as this half shell stability. So if you can take one from this one and put it in here and somehow get both of these to be half filled, or if you can just, yeah, you get this half filled over here, there's just something inherently more stable about that. And that's why you will find exceptions of the rule there in the periodic table as you go. Okay? But I would take either one. It's general chemistry. General. Stuff's hard enough, right? But on a standardized test, yeah, they, they, oh, they love chromium. It's usually chromium. They love to throw that question on there. I don't know why it's always chromium, but there you go. Okay? Can you do this? If I gave you an element and said, write me the electron configuration for it, could you write it for me? You know, I mean, geez, it, you just, just start here and keep filling them up. Aren't you glad I didn't give you something like bismuth, the 83 electrons or something like that? That'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, that's pretty long. All right. In, in the grand scheme of things, 
these electrons, yeah, it's nice to know how these are arranged, but it's really these outer electrons that I'm interested in. Okay, why am I so interested in the outer electrons? Well, because when two atoms touch, where are they going to touch? Well, they're going to touch at the electrons, right? And that's what tells me how they're going to react. Are they going to touch at the inner electrons or the outer electrons? We're going to touch out here at the outer electrons. So if I know how these outer electrons are arranged, and these outer electrons are arranged, that's going to give me some sort of insight into how they will react. So knowing how the inner or the core electrons are arranged is nice, but it's these outer ones that are really important here. So what you can do, if you want to make this a little shorter, is you can write what we call abbreviated electron configurations. All right? And the way you do that is you write the symbol of the last noble gas you pass in the periodic table on your way to that element in brackets, and then you write the rest of the electron configuration. All right? So for example, uh, write the abbreviated electron configuration for silver here for me. All right, well, if I find myself a periodic table, Hey, there's one right there. Then uh, what I do is I say, okay, I hear silver. This is what I'm looking for. I go through the periodic table. The last element or noble gas I get to before I get to silver would be krypton. See? So I'm going to write krypton in brackets. And what that does is that takes care of the first 36 electrons which would essentially be those right here. So when I write krypton, that takes care of that. So now I just write 5s2, 4d9, or 5s1, 4d10. And that's it. That's how you write the abbreviated electron configuration. So you're showing information about the outer electrons, and you're just putting the rest in. Now, it's got to be the last noble gas. Now, you can't say, I'm going to write the elect abbreviated electron configuration of silver. I'm going to put palladium in parentheses and then like a, you know, a, a 4D1 or something like that. Now, it, it's got to be the last noble gas over here if you're going to do it. That's the rule. All right. So if I want to do sulfur, for example, then here's sulfur. The last noble gas, I guess, is neon before I get to it. So I'd write neon, that would take care of these 10, and I'd write 3s2, 3p4, and there you go. So this is really handy when you're dealing with really long ones, because this, this can get really long. The shorter ones usually just write them on out. Before we go any further, I want you to notice something here. Let's look at this electron configuration here for oxygen. Okay, Where are the outer electrons in an oxygen atom found? Well, there's two of them in this 2s, and there's four of them in that 2p. Where are the outer electrons in a sulfur atom found? Well, there's two of them in this 3s, and there's four of them in this 3p. Hmm, kind of interesting. So notice that the outer electron configuration here for oxygen is really similar to this outer electron configuration here for sulfur. If the outer electron configuration is really similar, what might you infer about their chemical reactivity? Well, they may be very similar chemically, right? Not exactly the same. Oxygen is oxygen, sulfur, sulfur. But similar. Hmm. Where do you find oxygen and sulfur relative to each other in the periodic table? They're in the same group. Well, that's interesting. What do we know about elements in the same group? Elements in the same group in the periodic table are very similar chemically. Why are elements in the same group very similar chemically? They're similar because they have similar outer electron configurations. And that is why this is important. Because what you can do is you can take these electron configurations, how the electrons are arranged around the atom, and you can correlate that back to how things react in the laboratory or out here in the general world. And that's why electrons are so important to a chemist, because it allows us to determine how things are going to react. See? Do you remember we talked about the noble gases? 
That's group 18 there in the periodic table. What was so special about the noble gases? Well, they didn't react with anything, right? Why didn't they react with anything? Well, because we said there was something special about having 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, 86 electrons, right? Remember we said those were the magic numbers? If I can get an atom with those num numbers of electrons, then that would, that would make them very, very stable and not reactive. Well, are those numbers magic? Not really. Look at this. Here's argon with 18. Where are the outer electrons on the argon atom found? We have two of them in the outer S and six of them in the outer P. What does that do to this outer S and P? It makes it full. And that's what makes argon so stable. And that's what makes all your noble gases stable, is their outer S and P sublevels are full. Helium being the exception, 1S2, there is no such thing as a 1P, so once you filled up the 1S, 1S2, you filled up the first energy level, see? And that's what makes that stable. But that's it. Why are 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, 86, why are those the magic numbers? Well, essentially because n can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to infinity. Uh, L can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to n minus 1. Uh, m sub L can be anywhere from negative L up to 0 up to positive L. And uh, m sub S can be plus or minus 1 half. It, it all comes back to those rules that we talked about earlier. But that's why. It takes that number of electrons to fill up those outer S and P sublevels, and that's what makes them stable. How many electrons can I fit in an S? Two. How many electrons can I fit in a P? Six. What's two plus six? Eight. Two plus six is eight. Eight electrons. Hmm. File that away for future reference. That might become important somewhere down the road. All right. See? I explain things. It just, it takes me a while to do it, but eventually I do get around to it. I do keep my promises. So, what makes oxygen oxygen here? Well, number of protons, really, I guess. Electronically. Uh, well, you've got four electrons sitting in the uh, 2P. All right, and those are called the distinguishing electrons. Um, they're the electrons in the last sublevel of an atom. So the distinguishing electrons in an argon atom is there's six of them, uh, and they're in the 3P. The distinguishing electrons for silver is there's nine of them, they're in the 4D. Uh, the distinguishing electrons for calcium, there's four of them, and they're in a 4S. Distinguishing electrons for iron is uh, there's uh, six of them, and they're in a 3D. Uh, distinguishing electrons for carbon is there's two of them, and they're actually in a 2P. How am I doing that? Am I just... Uh, you know, counting all the way up with iron with 26 electrons and knowing I'm going to end up on uh, 3D6? Uh, am I really that smart? Or maybe I just did some editing here? No, well, no. I know a trick. Would you like to know that trick? How do I determine the distinguishing electrons just by looking at the periodic table? On top of that, I can even derive the electron configuration just by looking at the periodic table. I don't even have to have that chart or that order of filling anymore. How does that work? Well, your book has a really nice picture here. Here you go. Here's your periodic table. Looks something like this. Let's take a look at these columns over here, these two columns in blue over here, groups one and two. It's called the S block of the periodic table. All right. What these elements have in common is their outer electrons are all found in an S sublevel. And so the way you find out which one is you just simply count down the period. So let's say, for example, I'm dealing with potassium. Okay, where's the outer electron of potassium atom found? Well, it's found in an S. It's in 4, so 4S. And then I count across, and that tells me how many. So 4S1. How many columns are in the P block of the periodic table? Two columns. How many electrons can I fit in an, in a, in an S sublevel? Two. That's not by coincidence. So, for example, if I'm dealing with barium, well, I'm in the sixth row in the S block, so 6S. 
2 across 6s2. That simple. All right, go over here to this block of the periodic table. This uh, kind of um, pinkish color over here is called the p block of the periodic table. Okay, all of these elements, what they have in common is their outer electrons are found in a p sublevel. Count down what period you're in, what row you're in. You're in the p block. Count across, and that's how many electrons are there. How many columns do I have? in the P block. I have six. How many electrons can I fit in a P sublevel? Six. Again, not by coincidence. See how this is all tying together? So let's see. I think we talked about carbon, right? Well, I'm in the second row down. I'm in the P, so 2P. How many across? One, two, 2P2. Two two. How about oxygen? We did the electron configuration for that. Well, second row, one, two, three, four. 2p4. Isn't that what we got on the notes above? Sure is. How about sulfur? Third row, 1, 2, 3, 3p4. How about, um, how about bromine? Well, I'm in the fourth period, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4p, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 across, 4p5. Yep, it is that simple. So why didn't I show you that first? Well, <laughs> here's the reason I didn't show you that first. See these elements right here, sitting in the middle of the periodic table, groups 3 through 12? What do we call those? Those are your transition metals, remember? And remember I said that transition metal chemistry is a little bit harder to describe, because once you start mixing in d orbitals, things get a little more complicated. Well, your transition metals belong to the d block of the periodic table. And they all, all these uh, elements here, uh, have in common that their outer electrons are found in a D sublevel. Okay? Now I got rows here, but how many columns do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 columns in the D block. How many electrons can I fit in a D uh, sublevel? 10. All right, well, here's where it gets tricky. What's the lowest energy level that can have a D sublevel? Three. Three is the lowest energy level that can have a D sublevel. Okay? Because that's what? L equals uh, two. So it means D. So therefore, three can have a two with a two. It's got to be a three and then a two. Okay, look at your rules. So 3D, right? So although I'm in the fourth row down, this is a little offset. This is my 3D row. So this must be my 4D row, and then my 5D row, and then my 6D row. So we go from 4S2 to 3D10 back to 4P6. And that's a little tricky. And that's why I showed you the other method first. Um, this is takes a little while getting used to. All right. So let's look at iron here. We talked about iron. So, where are the last electrons on the iron atom found? Well, I'm in the 3D row. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 across 3D6. See? That's simple. Okay. All right, well, how about silver? We did silver, right? Let's check and make sure. So, we're here. So, I'm in the, this is a 3D. This must be the 4D row. 4D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 49. Isn't that what we got up there in our notes? Yeah, exactly what we got. Right there in our notes. See these elements down here? Kind of cut out and stuck down here at the bottom of the periodic table. I like they're just forgotten. Okay, It's called the elf block of the periodic table. And these elements are found in, uh, their outer electrons are found in an elf sublevel. All right, What's the lowest energy level that an elf, that can have an elf? Four. See, all of them can have an S, 2 and higher can have a P, 3 and higher can have a D, so 4 and higher can have an L. You know, if you forget, just count your way up. Say, well, S is all of them, so therefore P must be 2 and higher, D is 3 and higher, ah, L must be 4 and higher. So this is my 4F row, this is my 5F row. Okay? All of these elements right here actually belong in that one little square in the periodic table. All these elements belong in this little square. These are called your lanthanides, sometimes called your rare earths. 
and they all react. Uh, here's here's kind of a period that reacts very similar. Okay, all these elements react extremely similar to each other, and so they belong right here in the periodic table. Uh, these are your actinides because they come after actinium, uh, and uh, probably the most common would be, that you would know would be uranium and plutonium, you know, from nuclear bombs and things like that. Uh, these are all man-made past this point, and they're also really highly radioactive. They belong right here in the periodic table. And so they put them down here, because otherwise you'd have to make a really, really long periodic table. should be a gap right here in the periodic table. But that shortens things up a little bit. Same thing, you're in the 4F row. So let's say, for example, we're looking at uh, europium right here. Well, what, how, where are the last electrons? Well, I'm in the 4F row, so 4F, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, across 4F6. Notice that in this row, two rows, but 14 columns. How many electrons can I fit in a F sublevel? 14 electrons. See? And that's how you do it. In fact, I can actually generate the, the entire order of filling just by looking at that periodic table. I don't even need the little chart up here. Oh, there's a little chart right there. I don't even need that anymore. All right, look at your order of filling as I go through this and see if this isn't exactly what's written down on your paper. Here we go, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. 3p6, 4s2. Okay, now we're back to the D's. Remember, it's a little offset, so we're in the 3D row. 3d10. Now we're back to the P's, where it's by period number, so 4p6. 5s2, 4d10, 5p6. Okay, here's where it gets kind of fun. We're going to go 6s2, but these, remember, fit in here. So we're going to go down here first. So 6s2, 4f14, and then we're back to the Ds, 3, 4, 5, 5d10, and then we're back to 6p6. That's why I showed you the other method first, because it's a little tricky. Once you get used to it, this is a lot easier, but you got to get used to it. The other method is pretty foolproof. You can draw a straight line. You can do the other method. Uh, and so that's why I show you that first. Okay, all right, 6p6, what's next? 7s2, we're going to go down here, so 5f14, 6d10, and then 7p6. Now, isn't that exactly what you have written down in the order of filling from your little chart up above in your notes? Yes, it is. I don't even have to go back and look. It's exactly what you have written down. So the shape of the periodic table, it's funny shape, but there's a reason why it's funny shaped. We didn't just randomly throw those elements in certain spots. It's that way because of those four rules that we went back to with your quantum numbers. That's what influences it. Look, look, here, we go from calcium to scanium here, and it's right there. But look at this, magnesium to aluminum. Why is there a big gap right here in the periodic table? Because we needed room for the tidal? No. Well, if this is your 4D and this is your 3D, what should go right here? Well, these would be your 2D elements, and this would be your 1D elements. Why are there no elements there? Because there's no such thing as a 1D or a 2D. Only energy levels 3 and higher can have a D. L can be 0, 1, 2, 3, up to N minus 1. That's what it comes down to. Here's your 4P, your 3P, your 2P. What should be right here? Well, that'd be your 1P. How come there's no elements right here? Because only energy levels 2 and higher can have a P. There is no such thing as a 1P. So the shape of the periodic table is influenced by the electron configuration stuff that we've been talking about this whole chapter. And you can actually derive it just by looking at this instead of doing the order of filling like that. Do I care which way you get it? No, I don't care which way you get it. I just care that you get it. 
you can write the whole thing out and then go with the last uh, sublevel that you get to and it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess it was 5S1 for Ovidian. Um, or you can use what we're talking about here, the block thing. This is quicker, uh, but the other way is a little more foolproof. So whatever works for you. Um, I like to do it by looking at the periodic table, and I think it's a lot quicker. But, you know, it's up to you, I guess. Okay? So, that being said, give me the abbreviated electron configuration for a bismuth atom. Okay, well, bismuth is uh, way down here in the periodic table. All right? So if we want the abbreviated one, we can write the whole thing out and then abbreviate it, or we can actually just use the periodic table. So the last noble gas that I get to before I get to bismuth is what? Xenon? Okay, so we're going to put xenon in brackets, and that's going to take care of the first 54 electrons. Okay, so what comes after xenon? Well, we're down here this in the S block, so this would be what? 6S2? Let me go down here. 4F14, and we're back to the 5D, 5D10, and then 6P123. So xenon, 6S2, 4F14, 5D10, 6P3. And that is the abbreviated electron configuration for bismuth. All right. So I'm giving you two ways to find that order of filling. You can either do it by doing the chart with the little arrows, which is more cumbersome and takes more time, but is uh, pretty foolproof, I guess. Or you can do it just by looking at the periodic table, if you know about the S blocks and the T blocks and the D blocks and things like that. Um, and either way should get you the right answer if you know what you're doing. Okay? All right. Well, let me try to tie this whole thing together here. So, uh, calcium. Okay, how many electrons are in a, say I got a calcium atom that weighs 40. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in a calcium atom that weighs 40? Well, I know in the periodic table that calcium, uh, this doesn't really tell me much here, but has an atomic number of 20. So, atomic number of 20 means I have 20 protons. Neutral atom means I have 20 electrons. And if it weighs 40, Remember, you take the mass number minus the atomic number. That tells you the number of neutrons. So I've got 20 neutrons there as well. So if I wanted to draw a calcium atom, what would a calcium atom actually look like? Well, you've got a nucleus here that contains 20 protons and 20 neutrons. I'll draw the scale. And then you've got 20 electrons. Where are my 20 electrons? Well, 1s2, 2s2. 2p6, see there's my little three uh, loves there, 3s2, 3p6, notice it's the same as the 2p, just larger, 4s2, and there you go. That's what a calcium atom looks like. Isn't it pretty? Now, if I had drawn something like that for you in, on day one, you probably would have uh, just dropped the class automatically, right? But yes, we can do a little better than there's an electron cloud out there somewhere. We can specify regions of space where the electrons are more likely to be. But that is as far down the road as I can take you. I can't tell you where those 20 electrons are. I can only specify regions of space where they're more likely to be. That's quantum mechanics. And that's where we are in the 21st century. If you come up with a better theory, then you can teach that. And I hope you do someday. But I'm just telling you, this is this is as far down the road as I can take you. If you want to go further, you're probably going to have to either come up with something on your own or wait another decade or so until someone does go further. But this is where we are. Right? world's a complicated place. You're probably finding that out. It's not as simple as it was back when you were three. You took a nap and ate your peanut butter jelly sandwich and got went outside and played and came back in. Well, again, think about it. <laughs> you know, a lot of this stuff, 
you understand a little bit the first time. There are some things in science sometimes that you see. The first time you see it, you understand a little of it. The second time you see it, it's like, okay, I'm starting to see it a little bit better. Third time you see it, you, you may not completely understand it, but then you got a really good grasp on it. This is one of those things. So you do the best you can. Hopefully, a lot of this will fall into place for you at this point. If it does, then congratulations. But you are not the first person ever to struggle with quantum mechanics. We all struggle with quantum mechanics. But uh, that's kind of where we are. That's electron configurations. So, uh, yeah, okay. I guess we're at 37 minutes here. So that's probably a pretty good place to stop, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of videos in this chapter. So what are we going to do next time? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, electron configurations are fun, but I, I don't think that's really that much of a challenge for you. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to kick it up a notch. Electron configurations give you information about the first two quantum numbers in an electron, the energy level and the sublevel. What we're going to do next is we're going to talk about something called orbital diagrams, which are similar to electron configurations, but they're electron configurations on steroids. Orbital diagrams give you information about all four quantum numbers. So yeah, that sounds like a, a lot of fun there. So that's what we'll talk about next time. We'll talk about uh, orbital diagrams. We'll talk about electron configurations for ions. Um, and then we'll talk about trends in the periodic table, and, and I'm just really hoping I can get this done in one more video. Um, but if not one more video, at most two. It's, it's a long chapter. Okay? So that's a good place to stop right there. So uh, wrap your brain around all that and come back when your headache goes away uh, or before your homework's due, whichever comes first. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.